Great. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, this is Kathy Quinlan, IBM Senior Counsel, and I am going to introduce the speakers. And it's just about 9:30, so I'm going to kick off uh, kick off this morning's uh, CLE. Uh, the the topic of the CLE is uh, hot promotion law topics, charitable sales promotions, including the new California AAB-488 and influencer marketing on social media. Uh, before I introduce today's speakers, I wanted to cover a few housekeeping items. Uh, today's event is being recorded. If you have any objections, please do not continue with the program. Also, today's program has been approved for two New York professional practice CLE credits. Accordingly, there will be two codes giving, given during the program. The first will be given about one hour into the program and the second at the end. And if you have any questions uh, during the program, please post, post them in the chat function. Uh, with that, I wanted to introduce our two speakers today. Uh, first, we have Robert LaPlaca, who is a partner at Beryl Dana LLP. Rob practices in two primary areas, promotion law and commercial litigation. He leads the firm's promotion law practice, which includes sweepstakes, skill contests, instant win games, internet and mobile marketing promotions, trade promotions, and consumer offers. Rob counsels well-known brands as well as advertising and marketing companies from concept development through implementation to fulfillment. Rob also counsels clients on cause-related marketing, including commercial co-ventures and charitable promotions. He represents many major brands and their foundations. He works with clients on program concept, concept drafting and review, state registration and advertising. Rob's litigation practice includes complex commercial disputes involving corporate, contract, employment, real estate, and intellectual property. His practice includes federal and state courts, as well as domestic and international arbit arbitrations. Our, our second speaker today is Bayan Peepmeyer. Uh, Bayan is a member of Blue Tryon Brands in-house legal department, where he primarily primarily supports Ready Refresh, a home and office delivery service that provides bottled water, filtration equipment, and other products to customers across the United States on a daily basis. Bayan regularly works on complex commercial agreements, M&A transactions, data privacy and security matters, and real property transactions and leases. He also supports Ready Refresh's marketing efforts, including reviewing and advising on advertising, copy, and promotions, as well as influencer engagements. Uh, prior to joining Blue Triton Brands, Bayan was an associate in the corporate law department of Day Pitney LLP in Stamford, Connecticut. With that, uh, Rob and Bayan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thanks, Kathy. Uh, so here we go. We have hot topics in promotion law. As Kathy mentioned, uh, two times throughout the uh, presentation, I'm going to give a uh, secret word for your uh, CLE. And because this is promotion law topics, uh, if during any of the Q&A, which I'm gonna segue in, you could uh, at any time uh, go into the Q&A or the chat function and uh, type in your question and we'll try to address it as, as it comes up or we'll catch them at the end and there'll be questions at the end. And at the end, we may even consider uh, opening it up uh, opening up the microphones uh, to make it even easier to communicate. So feel free to ask as many questions, make as any statement uh, as you want. Uh, but getting back to that, if you happen to mention the magic word yourself, uh, like I said, because this is promotion law, uh, Brian is going to give you free uh, Blue Triton water <laughs> products uh, uh, as, as needed, uh, if you happen to mention that. So with that, uh, the agenda for today, uh, cause marketing, which is a very broad term, uh, basically anytime brands uh, want to bring uh, charities or charitable uh, issues uh, into their marketing, uh, but specifically focusing on one of the most uh, heavily regulated areas called commercial co-ventures. So we're gonna go over uh, in more detail 
what a commercial co-venture is, uh, what the legal requirements are for uh, effectuating a, co a commercial co-venture campaign, including uh, the contract that you need to have, what provisions you need to have in it, what advertising disclosures, your certain registration and bonding, and uh, go over the uh, charity obligations. Uh, I'm gonna hit on a little bit. There's other reg regulated en entities in the uh, cause marketing area. So I'm gonna hit on what they are, who they are, when you should uh, have a little uh, red light that comes on that, hey, we might be a regulated entity if we wanna do this uh, and know what the ins and outs are in that and whether you wanna go through with that. And then uh, interestingly enough, California last year, passed a new law. Uh, the bill was called Assembly Bill 488. So I identified it here because it has a very long name. Uh, the California AB 488 that regulates uh, pause marketing, uh, specifically online in California. So now California has uh, new regulations where entities uh, need to register if they uh, fall into the new law. And there's also additional requirements to comply with the new law. So I want you to be aware of that because that becomes effective January 1 of 2023. And lastly, not, uh, we will spend a significant amount of time going over influencer marketing and in particular the guidelines with regard to endorsements, which uh, apply to influencers. Uh, we're going to give you some practical tips uh, tell you also what the guidelines are, what you need to do to comply, and go over some of the recent enforcement actions. And uh, when when uh, I first proposed to Lee about uh, doing the commercial co-venture and the cause marketing stuff, uh, Lee was like, well, uh, that might not cover the two hours, so we need to get another topic in. And to me, it was sort of like, uh, okay, well, let's, you know, apples and oranges, let's throw in influencer marketing. And when I got a little bit deeper into it, they both have the, the way California has the new uh, law governing cause marketing uh, in September, October, and earlier this year, there was a lot more interest and uh, in terms of regulatory and enforcement actions in influencer marketing. And also there's been a, a, a bigger push on having influencers involved in the cause marketing. So they really do relate, maybe more like peanut butter and banana uh, than apples and oranges. So with that, let's get right into cause marketing. So as I said, cause marketing is, is a broad term that's gonna include any time you, you as a brand want to uh, get involved with a particular charity or with a charitable purpose. So this, as I said, is going to include commercial co-ventures. Another term for that is charitable sales promotion. So that's when it involves your sales. Uh, it can include, uh, among other things, uh, the donations at checkout. When you see, uh, would you like to round up to donate to a charity? Uh, a lot of times at checkout uh, or on the internet, uh, brand's going to say, you know, you as the donor choose which one uh, to which which of these charities to donate to. Uh, peer to peer, uh, more uh, driven sometimes by the charity, but that's a situation where you have the the donors or someone who's interested in a cause uh, getting involved uh, and trying to get their uh, friends, colleagues to uh, support the cause. Uh, typical example, like a GoFundMe type situation. Uh, you see a lot of times now with sweepstakes being involved with donations, where uh, make a donation to to get a free entry into it, get an entry into a sweepstakes, or where uh, the company will say, you know, if uh, you make a donation. Or if uh, you do that, we will make the donation to charity uh, and you'll receive a free entry. So sweepstakes are becoming uh, a cause marketing uh, method. Uh, obviously, companies have always done flat donations and 
sponsored events in many different ways. And I know a lot of you out there uh, have many different cause marketing initiatives. Uh, so this is a familiar area, but uh, that just so you know, but like I said, mainly here, we're going to talk about the most he heavily regulated, the charitable sales promotions. So, and if you run just a little intro into uh, cause marketing video, that'd be great. Essendo una volontaria in diversi campi, mai come ora ho potuto constatare quello che Kimberly fa per l'ambiente, la salute e le persone. Per me il volontariato è una boccata d'aria pulita, rubare un sorriso, una stretta di mano è la cosa più bella che possa esistere. So, just a, a little a little example there of how companies uh another way where you get your employees involved and i know a lot of you do that uh to go out on their own and uh support causes and you support your employees by doing that so just another area and another important thing as you can find from that example uh you know it's part of publicizing the fact that you do this so people know so why do you want to let people know and why do people in one way do cause marketing? Because uh, the numbers, as you know, uh, show the cause marketing works. Here's some recent statistics that, uh, you know, I found and uh, customers, the bottom line is customers like it when brands are involved in uh, cause marketing. Uh, the and what you also see is that the younger people, the millennials, the, X, the, the Gen Xers, the Gen Zers, they are even more interested that a company is involved in some way with regard to uh, cause marketing. Uh, Brian, let me let me punt over to you for a second. Uh, you know, you, you've had experience in, in in marketing for a number of years now. Uh, you know what kind of differences have you seen in terms of uh, any increase in in wanting to do cause marketing? Oh yeah, it, it's a it's a critical and a growing area. I mean, as you as you touched on, both from a brand standpoint and facing our customers, but also from an employee and an HR standpoint, letting our folks know that they can be involved in causes they care about, and that can be supported by the company at frankly every level, including financially. Um, as well as just being a good, a good corporate citizen for the many communities in which we operate. We have uh, facilities and, and properties across the United States from rural spring sites in, in Maine all the way to our corporate headquarters in Stanford, Connecticut. Uh, and so letting stakeholders in those areas know that Blue Triton Brands is involved. And when we do that is by putting our money where our mouth is, so to speak, is, is critical. And I think all these statistics that you have on screen there bear that out. Right. And I think, uh, you know, the, 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 the often used phrase of uh, you, you do good by doing good is, uh, you know, I think really something that plays itself out. But, and if you move on, the, the, the main issue that, that's seen sometimes is that you're not just doing cause marketing because everybody else is doing it and it's a good uh, way to sell more products. Uh, the, the consumers out there, and in particular, your younger consumers, they really want to make sure that uh, you are interested in the cause, that the cause is somehow related to uh, your company and your business, and that uh, you really have an investment uh, in this. Uh, Brian, 
what what types of things you know I, I don't want to put you on the spot but you know how does how does blue triton do do uh things to 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 show the uh the consumers that you know you you have a genuine interest in the causes that you're that you're supporting yeah it's it's a that's a, a two-part answer the first is you know we have certain priorities and areas that we tend to to focus on um and then the second part is frankly, sticking with those, uh, not bouncing from item to item around or hot cause to hot cause. So for, as many people know, we're a bottled water company. We make Poland Spring. And so one of the items that we do consistently is when there is a natural disaster, uh, whether a hurricane in Florida, a flood, uh, significant power outages or fires, uh, we try to be there first on the scene with donations of our products to make sure first responders are hydrated, impacted persons are hydrated. Uh, and using that as our as our way of both obviously helping the communities we're in, but then from a, a marketing standpoint, letting the country, our employees, others know that where there's a problem and we can add value given our, our product portfolio, we, we try to be there in a big way and fast and early. Right, right. And, then, and that that's the key, uh, uh, you know, making sure uh, your participation is genuine. And... I'd love to be able to give a prize and throw a duck to the person who asked the first question, but we do have our first question. Uh, I did mention the word sweepstakes, and incidentally, that was going to be the magic word, but then when we're told we can't use a magic word that uh, is related to the topic. So you would have won a free year supply of water, but uh, unfortunately, that wasn't, the, that wasn't the word. But the question is, if a sweepstakes requires the participant to make a donation to a charity in order to enter, why isn't this considered consideration, which could run the risk of sweepstakes being seen as an unlawful lottery? And that is a great question because those of us who know sweepstakes law know you have uh, the three issues of uh, prize consideration and um, chance to have an illegal lottery. So you have to take one of those out to be a legal lottery. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna just go a little bit, I'm gonna get a little bit more into detail, just a little bit. Uh, to deal with the sweepstakes question later on in the program, but I'm going to address a little bit of it now. So you have price chance consideration to be a sweepstakes. You have to take one of them out. Except one, if you're a charity, if the charity's running the sweepstakes, they could actually do a raffle, but that's very heavily regulated. You should look at local laws. I mean, you may, need, may even need to register in your particular town if you want to run a uh, an actual raffle where people just buy raffle tickets. Uh, a lot of state laws even require you know specific rules in terms of the raffle tickets that they have. They need to have the numbers and corresponding numbers on each side and et cetera. So that's one little area that if the sweepstakes uh, or if the uh, charity is doing it, they could actually run a raffle. But if the charity is just running a regular old sweepstakes uh, where there is a chance involved to win a prize, you're absolutely right. Besides making the donation to charity as a way to enter, there's going to also need to be an alternate method of entry that is free, an AMOE. So you need to have a free method of entry. You could have make the donation and we'll give you one entry for every dollar or one entry for every donation, but you also have need to have a free method, mail in, online, something like that, where you do have that and that will take it out of the unlawful lottery because yes, paying or making the donation is, in, is consideration is involved. I wanna point out another thing that uh, it, it's my uh, uh, belief that uh, when a charity says make the donation to, to us and you will get an entry and then also has a separate AMOE, that that is not gambling. Another issue, because gambling is the risking or staking of money. So you can't just pay to play. You need to get something in return uh, when you actually pay the money. So besides having a free method, when you have the pay method, the person needs to get something in return. They can't just be betting the money. 
here because it's directly to the charity you're getting the the goodwill involved in making a donation directly to charity you're getting the tax deduction so you are getting something in return whereas if a brand that's not a charity is saying make this donation pay this money to charity and that money will go to charity you have a separate amoe a a m o e you may have the problem of in that instance not giving something in return uh for the entry and it could possibly be considered uh gambling because the person is just paying money directly to the uh to to the uh uh, charity. Sorry, I'm I'm reading here. And Blanchard would like to. Okay, sorry, just reading that. So now we are on to the next slide. And and as I said, influencers are now becoming uh, much more involved in the uh, cause marketing area, uh, where uh, it said here that uh, millennials, of course who are very big in the influencer world and, and, and love following inf influencers for some reason, uh, they like the fact that their influencers are now engaging in a cause. Uh, and the millennials have now done, taken some action, usually in favor of buying a product from a brand, because the influencer has uh, also taken up this cause. Uh, Brian, I don't know if 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 you've had the experience of of tying in influencers with cause marketing yet. Is that something you've you've? Yeah, had? it's 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 not something that I, I can say we've done a, a whole lot of. Although certainly the use of influencers, that we'll get to later in this presentation, yeah. has been a key part of our reaching out to particular demographics, the, the millennials, and then I would also add on top of that the the Gen Z generation as well. Yeah. Yes, yes. And just, uh, I, I, I looked this up myself. You guys may already know this since you're involved in marketing, but apparently Gen X is people from 1965 to 1980. Uh, millennials are people born 1981 to 1996. And the Gen Z are the people born 1997 to 2012. So uh, when we're using those terms, uh, that that's essentially what we're what these statistics are backing up. So now we're going to get into commercial co-ventures in particular. And if you are uh, running a commercial co-venture, uh, basically this is a charitable sales promotion where you're selling a product and as a result of that sale, it's going to trigger a donation by you, the brand, to a charity. So the program itself is a commercial co-venture. You, as the brand, may be considered a commercial co-venturer. Uh, obviously, the charity, that's the nonprofit that receives the donations. Uh, I want to point out that uh, commercial co-ventures in a lot of state statutes could also just involve when, it, uh, when the money's going for a charitable purpose, uh, and perhaps not even to a particular charity. Uh, as I said, the commercial co-venturer is the brand, they sell the goods, they make the donation, and a lot of states, and in particular, we got to worry about Illinois, as I'll get to, uh, they have uh, a charitable trustee, which uh, is defined as a person or a company who holds money in trust for the benefit of a charity. So we need to consider that because if you think about it, if, if the brand is saying you buy this product, which is a $2 product, and we'll make a $1 donation to XYZ charity, after the consumer makes that purchase, pays you $2, conceivably the brand company is now holding $1 in trust for the charity. So you may be considered a charitable trustee under certain laws and have obligations to make sure you segregate the money and you promise to make sure that money gets to uh, the charity. A little background. Uh, although these are hot promotion law topics, uh, commercial co-ventures, uh, basically the law is started back in 1983 
when uh, American Express wanted to raise money to restore the Statue of Liberty. And American Express said, we'll get donate a penny every time somebody makes a card transaction and we'll donate, I believe it was a dollar every time someone becomes a new card holder. And they ran this promotion, uh, I think it was for a number of months over the summer. Uh, that raised almost $2 million for the Statue of Liberty Foundation. Uh, sales rose, uh, usage of the card rose by about 30%. And since then, everybody uh, you know, has started to see that tying in your sales to a cause both helps build the Statue of Liberty, helps the charity, and helps the company itself. So just a little background there that that's the traditional uh, start of commercial co-ventures. So, and if you move on, the basic definition, as I said, is when a brand, they sponsor a sales promotion and the sales promotion advertises that a portion of the proceeds from the sale of a good or service will go to charity. A uh, couple important uh, words to take into account there, that it's a sales promotion. It's not an ongoing uh, business uh, operation, that it's a promotion, it's a time-limited thing, uh, that it's being advertised, that you're telling the public, hey, public, if you buy this, we'll donate that, uh, that the money comes directly from the sale of a good or a service, uh, that it goes to a charity or like I said, a charitable purpose, and that the definition or that the uh, donation is being made by the brand. It's not being made by the consumer. So those are all important elements, but as I said, it boils down to the brand saying in the advertising to the consumer, if you buy this, We'll donate that. Now, there's a couple states, there's about 23 states that have commercial co-venture laws. Uh, not all 50 states do, about 23 do. Uh, and th three of them, which I've called the goodwill states, Alabama, Massachusetts, and South Carolina. Their definitions uh, of what a commercial co-venture is could be considered much broader than the sales promotion where you sell uh, a good or service and as a result of that, you make a donation. And I put the definition here, I think it's almost identical for all three of these states, uh, but as you can see, it's much broader. So any person who for profit or other consideration, and then they get into conducts, produces, promotes, underwrites, arranges, or sponsors. So you can do a lot of different things. Uh, a performance event or sale. So now it's much broader than a sale. Uh, and obviously it's to the public and it's advertised in conjunction with the name of a charitable uh, organization or is benefiting a charitable purpose. So as you can see, you might question yourself and you say, well, what if we just ask somebody to like our, our post? If you like our post, we'll make a donation to charity. You're not asking somebody to put to take money out of their pocket, which is the concern of most of the states that have commercial co-venture laws, that before you advertise to someone and you're going to compel them to dig into their wallet to pay you money, that you better comply with our laws and we have regulations to deal with this. Here, all you're asking them to do is just like a page, which isn't a big effort, which isn't really uh, costing the person any money to do that. But you have to think to yourself, what about Alabama, Massachusetts, and South Carolina? Is that going to be a, uh, that you're getting some kind of commercial consideration out of these likes? Is this sponsoring a performance or event of some kind? Uh, it's obviously being advertised in conjunction with the charity. So these are the situations where you have to consider do I need to comply with the laws of the goodwill states when it's a non-purchase activity? 
And what I can tell you is it's basically a risk analysis. Uh, some people will say, you know what? Out of an abundance of caution, let's just comply with the goodwill states. And others will say, you know what? Just liking a page or, or some non-purchasing activity really isn't what these statutes were meant to deal with. So we're, we're you know, we, we don't need to strictly comply with all the requirements under these statutes. And unfortunately, this is not the area where we have a lot of guidance. There's not a particular lot of, regula uh, of, of regulatory action in these areas, especially getting into minutia of whether you like the page and that triggered the laws of Alabama. Uh, it gets more into the issues where there is, where there is some regulatory action in a situation where the company didn't make the donation uh, or the entire uh, thing was a fraud. So those are the areas where the regulation really starts to hit. You're not going to get case law that you're going to ask an associate to go do some research and see if there's case law interpreting what this statute means. Uh, so it's a risk analysis. And the reason why it comes up as a risk analysis, as you'll see later, six states require registration if you're going to run a commercial co-venture. Unfortunately, Alabama, Massachusetts, and South Carolina are three of those states that require registration. So it's not just a matter of complying with the law, which you could do absent the, the uh, registration part. You could do that when you think liking a page may be a uh, commercial co-venture under Alabama law. The issue is you're going to have to go out and register in Alabama, Massachusetts, and South Carolina if you're going to make the decision that a non-purchase activity is uh, getting involved uh, with that statute. So as I said, not great guidance on this. Uh, you may hear different opinions on, on when it comes up, but I want to point out to you that that's an issue. So next, I want to get into the actual legal requirements uh, to run a commercial co-venture. So basically, as I said, you have 23 states with commercial co-venture laws. And if you do these things, you're going to comply with the laws of all 23 states because a lot of these promotions are national promotions. So you want to comply with uh, all of the uh, all of the state requirements. So you need to do it with a charity that's a registered charity in all of the applicable states where you're running the promotion. Charities have registration requirements to be registered as a charity in places that they solicit. So it is arguable that when you're having a nationwide promotion and you're asking people to make a, a purchase in Idaho or in Kansas uh, that's gonna trigger a donation that the brand is now soliciting on behalf of the charity and therefore the charity needs to be registered in all of those states. So you wanna check that your charity is a nationwide charity. Charities have registration in about 40 states, not all 50 require the charity be, to be registered. But uh, those are uh, your first priority. Make sure your charities is registered everywhere uh, that you want to run the promotion. The next, you're gonna have to have a written contract between the charity, uh, with the charity. Uh, I will go through in a later slide what the requirements are. There are certain uh, mandatory contract provisions that you need to have, but you can't just pick a charity in general and say, we're gonna donate to this charity. You need to actually make sure you sign them up and they're on board with this promotion because it's a commercial co-venture, meaning co-venture uh, by, by both ends. There are mandatory ad disclosures, which I'm gonna go over for you uh, that need to be made anytime uh, you advertise this promotion. Uh, you need to keep an accounting, the records of the sales, the records of the donations for at least three years. And as I mentioned, you're going to have registration and or bonding requirements in six states, Alabama, Hawaii, Illinois, Massachusetts, Mississippi, South Carolina, 
And as I mentioned, there is a registration requirement in California under old California law as one thing and under new California law. So I'm going to explain both of those to you uh, later on, but this is just a little heads up on what the legal requirements are. So you do these things, you could run a commercial co-venture, but you need to make sure you consider that, that you need to be doing all of these things. So let's dig into each one of them. Rob, can I ask a quick question? For yes, our, please. If you're, if, if you're a, a company like ours that's circling a charity you want to engage, what kind of due diligence do you recommend before you even get to the contract stage that you do? Should we be asking for, obviously, certificates of incorporation, evidence you're an actual 501c3? What other, you know, show me evidence that you're registered in all these applicable states. What, 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 what should I ask for? Right. Generally, I think you, you would want to make sure, at the very least, that it is a 501c3, that you're making a donation to an actual charity, a charitable organization. Uh, and uh, in terms of whether you're going to confirm with them, uh, yes, it would be best practice to actually confirm with them either that they are comfortable with uh, the fact that they are that you're comfortable and they're comfortable with the fact that they are registered nationwide and they could solicit in all states or because the, the that issue really puts the onus on them because the registration part is on their thing to be concerned about because it's their registration whenever they are soliciting within that state so maybe their corporate counsel has taken a decision that, you know what, we don't believe that soliciting is occurring because this is an online activity, because we're not going to be actively advertising in that state, even though it's open nationwide. So I'm more concerned with confirming that the charity is a charity, is a 501c3 that you're going to be making the donation. You can get the tax deduction for it. You can tell everybody that this is an actual charity. In terms of the solicitation part, that's a little bit, like I said, more of an onus on the charity itself and that they're comfortable with this is a nationwide promotion. It's not going to necessarily fall much on the brand, but I pointed out that uh, at least out of an abundance of caution, it would be a good idea that the charity is registered everywhere uh, where they need to be for solicitation is, is the best as I could uh, answer that. And uh, Brian, on that point too, uh, you know, I think, you know, there's the due diligence of just, you know, investigating your charity. Uh, you know, there's a lot of big charities uh, and there's a lot of small charities and uh, whatever information you could get in terms of, you know, have they had any problems uh, you know, what's the word on the street about this charity? Uh, because you, you know, you'd like to avoid the situation where God forbid you're in the middle of a promotion and some bad news comes out about the charity that, uh, you know, the, the CEO is stealing money or something like that. And then you're really put in a pickle. Uh, so a little background information, uh, digging on the charity itself is obviously a, a good practical consideration. Um, Question, if you are doing a promotion where you are selling special marketing materials, hats, t-shirts, other tchotchkes that help support our charitable efforts, would that be a CCV? The answer is yes. It does not matter whether you are selling a specially made product or you're selling your regular products or you're selling your regular products with special uh, advertising on them. If you are selling a product and you are asking the public to buy this and you are telling the public that if you buy this, I will make a donation to charity, that is a commercial co-venture. And if you are saying that it is going to, to some charitable purpose, that is going to also be a, char a, a commercial co-venture because the other besides the goodwill states, the definition of commercial co-venture in the other states with the typical sales uh, trigger of a commercial co-venture 
are also drafted broad enough that it's not just to a charity, but it's for a charitable purpose. So yes, special tchotchkes, charitable purpose, as long as you're asking the, the, the uh, consumer to go into their pocket, and if they go into their pocket and buy this, and you're going to make the donation to charity, you're going to be a commercial co-venture. Like I said, and we're going to get into the details, the legal requirements outside of registration aren't that tough. The registration is a thing that is a, is a little more engaging on, on, on your end. Not, not hard, but just a little more of an effort. Uh, and Maureen asks, are there any are there any states where you need to register your commercial co-venture? And yes, those are Alabama, Mississippi, Illinois, uh, South Carolina, and Massachusetts. So uh, those are the states where you need to register uh, your commercial co-venture. So these are the general requirements and let's dig into them. So one, you need to have a contract with the charity. When you look through all of the different state laws, you get together that your contract needs to say all of these things, that you need to identify the specific item. So whether it's a specific tchotchke that we're gonna have specially made pens. And when we sell a specially made pen, that's gonna trigger a donation. You need to be very specific in your contract and in your advertising. So everybody knows that if I buy this pen, I'm making a donation to charity. But if you buy that pen, I'm not making the donation to charity. So very specific on what the items are going to be. It's, as I said, it is a sales promotion. So it's gonna be time limited. So you're gonna say when the promotion is going to run, if it'll be nationwide or if it's limited, you need to say where it's going to be run. Next, you're going to have a provision in there on how the charity's name is going to be used by the brand. So that's, one of the main reasons for having a uh, contract is you get the license from the charity to use their name, logo, et cetera, in advertising. Negotiating point in terms of whether the charity is going to have some oversight on how you use it, uh, on reviewing the advertising beforehand, but uh, you need to have their permission uh, to use their name and logo in the advertising. You need to be specific on the per unit percentage or per unit amount being donated. And this gets back, I think, you know, to the issue of, you know, a, a lot of people like to, a lot of brands like to tie in a purchase to a donation. And uh, when you see things like buy this and a portion of the proceeds will go to charity, or when you buy this item, we'll make a donation to charity. Those types of promotions are not complying with the statutes in, regarding commercial co-ventures. I would wanna say that almost all of the, if not all of the states that have the commercial co-venture laws, they all specify uh, that you need to identify the actual per unit percentage or per unit amount. So you need to say that when you buy this pen, I will donate 50 cents or I will donate 10% uh, of our uh, of, of all sales to the promote to to the charity. I also have a, a word of caution that if you are going to use the percentage that we're going to donate 10% of all profits to charity, do you know what that number is? Don't know. I, I, it may not be easily identified for the company, let alone the consumer, to know that if you're going to donate 10% of your profits when I buy this pen, I don't know how much that is. I have no idea how you calculate your profits and what they are. Is this going to be 90 cents for the pen or is it going to be half a nickel? Uh, so be careful with your words. Tell them what you're doing. Tell them that I'm going to donate a penny for every uh, transaction, or I'm going to donate 50% of the purchase price. So they know how much is being donated. Uh, a lot of times, which uh, makes a lot of sense in terms of planning your promotion, you're going to have perhaps a maximum, 
perhaps a minimum donation. Uh, sometimes you may have both. I'm gonna talk a little bit later about what you need to be concerned about uh, with these types of uh, restrictions, but uh, that's something that needs to be in your contract. Uh, the states of Georgia, New Hampshire, and New Jersey all say in their statutes, make sure you put in your contract that our law applies. So put in a contract that their law applies. Uh, New York says there has to be a provision where uh, the charity could cancel in 15 days. And for some, uh, a number of states actually say you need to have two officers of the charity sign the contract. So that's something that you may overlook because it is a odd uh, thing that, uh, that you have to comply with. But uh, you need two officers of charity for a valid nationwide commercial co-venture promotion. So moving along. Rob, quick, quick, Rob, quick yes, question. Please, if, Brian. If, if I have a contract that doesn't have one of these provisions in it, is it is it not enforceable, or does does a state come in and say you have to amend it to include this, or what what kind of consequences might I face? Very good question. Uh, the contract itself is still going to be enforceable. There's not anything in the statutes that specifically says if you do not have these that the contract is now null and void or voidable, et cetera. So. In terms of contract law with the charity, you're still going to have a valid contract. You're still going to be committed to making these donations when you have it. Uh, as a matter of practice, I've, there, there are no states that go out there and review your contract that's going to make you pull the promotion. Uh, even the states that require registration which typically requires filing a copy of the contract. When you file the copy of the contract, it's not like you're gonna get kicked back from the states, oh, this doesn't have that Georgia law applies, or it's not going to have, uh, they're not going to review your contract to make sure that it complied with all of the different state laws. So one, this is the right way to do it. Two, if you happen to miss some of these things, it's probably not gonna be a big deal, but if you happen to miss some of these things and something goes wrong with your promotion and then your promotion's looked at and you find out that you don't have permission from the charity to use their logo, that you don't have two signatures of the, of, of the, uh, of the charity's officers, then that may get dug into a little bit more. But as a matter of practice, it's not like there's gonna be some overseer who's going to look at this at the get-go and say you pass go you could run your promotion it's like anything uh you know it's a, it's trying to do it right in the first place and uh uh hoping hoping that uh uh if you did make a, a minor mistake that it's it's considered as such and generally in this area like i said it's not heavily uh overseen in a large part i think because it is an area where the states want to see that, that there is good happening and they want to see these kinds of promotions happen. They don't want to see major mistakes, like I said, uh, making bad disclosures to, to uh, the consumer so the consumer has no idea what you're doing or stealing, fraud, all of those really bad things that could happen. So it's that type of area where there's a lot of regulation, but not as much oversight as you would expect from all of this type of regulation. Hmm. Okay, uh, I mentioned the next thing with the, uh, the mandatory contract provisions. Uh, currently in California, uh, bef before the new law, as I mentioned, California still has a registration requirement, but you could avoid it as long as you have in your contract that you're gonna make a donation with an accounting every 90 days, that you're gonna make the final donation with an accounting every 90 days, and that it's signed by two uh, officers of the, char of, the, uh, of the charity. So if you have those, that exempts you from regist registering under the current law uh, in California. But I wanted to point that out because someone will uh, always say, hey, California also requires uh, requires you to register. Two more questions. A great question. If it's a charitable purpose, but you haven't identified a specific charity, not using a charity name, how would that 
be able to register as a commercial go venture? That is a very good question. And <laughs> that is why uh, it's the issue of you are going to need to have a specific charity that you're making donations to. And you are going to have to have a contract with that charity. I, the, I think you, it, what gets tied up is the laws are meant in terms of the advertising to the public. So as I said, it's a promotion where you advertise to the public that the donation is going to support a charitable purpose. So therefore, that doesn't necessarily mean that you could still do it legally by not having a specific charity involved. What that means is in your advertising, if you say, if you buy this pen, we will donate 50, 50 cents to help animals in the wild. There has to be an underlying charity there, but maybe your advertising message is just advertising that it's a uh, charitable purpose. So I think the laws are trying to cover the, the, the situation where you're telling the public, hey, there's a charitable purpose involved, but that still doesn't mean that you, that, that, that you don't need to have what you do, an underlying charity where the money's going to, uh, that, need, that you need to have the contract with. So hopefully that answers that. Is it possible to have the consumer choose the charity from a list that you provide? Yes, it is. That makes it much more difficult because with the red, it, all in terms of registration, it makes it more difficult in terms of registration because you're going to have to register uh, perhaps in those states three different times because there's three different charities involved because the registration may be dependent, not necessarily on the program, but it, it, it may be by charity. So a lot of those registration states might get a little quirky in terms of how you do this. But yes, you could have multiple charities uh, to, to make a donation to. One, if it, I would recommend, recommend if you're big enough that a lot of companies that are big enough, they make the donation to their own foundation. They're, they make a foundation which itself is a nonprofit. You make the donation to your nonprofit, the nonprofit to your own foundation. Your foundation can then donate the money to different charities or different causes. And in this way, you're able to open it up to different causes and different charities. But the registration part, the donation is first being made directly to your foundation. You need to disclose this a little bit in the advertising so that people know exactly what you're doing. But that's an area where you could open it up sometimes a lot more easier if you're big enough and you have your own foundation uh, than trying to pick between a number of charities. Plus, the accounting and those records get a little bit more funky if uh, you're having to consume consumers pick which charities, but definitely you could run it that way. Uh, just, you know, it takes a little more thought and consideration. Thanks for those questions. Those are really good. Uh, next, charities obligations. And, and you're way ahead. No, you're not. Okay, mandatory ad disclosures, mandatory contract provisions. Okay, ad disclosures. So to comply with all the state laws, you need to have specific ad disclosures. The ad disclosures need to say the amount that's being donated. If there's a min or maximum, where it's happening, the time period, the name, address, and phone by statute of the charity, Massachusetts, law, if you read it, says that you need to identify how the funds are be used or that the uh, that you are a paid fundraiser, which is completely anomalous with what an actual paid fundraiser is. And California, if you look at their statute, you may have to disclose not tax deductible. You might have seen millions of these. The last two, you basically never see. It's not heavily enforced. Uh, that you make these disclosures and the charity name, address, phone, uh, especially for online donations where you're making the disclosure uh, online, having the link to the charity's website is usually quite sufficient. Uh, so I think, you know, once again, it's not a, an area where the regulators are looking at this all of the time and coming after you for not disclosing in your adds how the funds will be used. But it is an area where if you're not telling them 
how much is being donated or what the period is or whether there's a minimum or maximum. Those are the areas that are really important. So I have to tell you as a, as a uh, presenter here that yes, if you read all the statutes, you're gonna see these requirements. But in practice, you're gonna see something like what I wrote here at the bottom as a sufficient uh, advertising disclosure. So next. And as I said, registration and bonding. If you get these materials, uh, I, I'll just, you know, identifying the names here that you have these requirements. They're each a little bit uh, different in a way. Uh, the bottom line is you're going to have at least 10 days out uh, to satisfy all the different requirements. So uh, this is a pre-planning type of thing to get the registration done. Two of the states require bonds, uh, which is an extra expense. Uh, I point out Illinois uh, in terms of the registration and bonding. Illinois, you're not registering as a commercial co-venturer. Illinois, they have interpreted their charitable trust law as specifically applying to commercial co-venture situations. As I said, the situation where can arguably the brand is holding the money in trust until they make the donation. So Illinois requires commercial co-venturers to register under their charitable trust act. So just a little asterisk when you're considering one of these types of promotions, don't forget Illinois. Uh, under their Charitable Trust Act. There is a, uh, I think a 4,000 uh, minimum. So if it's a small promotion, you don't have to worry about it, but a, a major promotion, you're gonna reach the minimum to have to register as a charitable trust. Rob, this is just yeah. to hop in here from my in-house yeah, perspective please. and for the in-house lawyers here, I think this is a really an opportunity where good communication with your marketing department is critical because you don't want to end up in a situation where they tell you, hey, tomorrow we're going to launch this big promotion with the Red Cross. It's going to be in Illinois. It's going to be in Hawaii. It's going to be in Alabama. And now you're scrambling to try to make a filing uh, within too tight of a deadline. And so a little bit of, I think, uh, advising, even this is somewhere on the radar for your marketing colleagues ahead of time, makes a lot of sense. Uh, just yeah, so you get, don't, get, don't get caught flat-footed. You're, you're exactly right. I mean, my my advice to clients is, uh, you know, I like them to be able to be ready to go about three weeks before the start of the promotion, conceivably a month. And I'm talking ready to go, not even like your initial, hey, this is a great idea. Because you do have issues. You're going to need to identify charities. You're going to need to do some background. You're going to have to have a contract. There might be some provisions you need to negotiate. And if you're going to comply with all the registration requirements, besides getting a bond uh, for, the two, for the two states, you know, you're going to need to make your filings at least 10 days beforehand. So uh, yes, it's definitely not something that you uh, just come up with as a great idea. Let's start tomorrow. Very good point. Next, Dan. So the charity, as I said, if they are soliciting, uh, they would come under the, uh, a lot of the state statutes in terms of when you need to register in that state. I point out here in terms of the registration and soliciting uh, what's called the Charleston principles. Uh, they're not law, but they're followed in some states uh, where it's just an online only uh, promotion. Some states, because of the Charleston pr principles or just in general, might not consider that uh, actual solicitation within the state. Uh, so the states may get away with uh, uh, not having to register there, which goes back to the question you asked earlier, Brian, in terms of, you know, how much do I need to check the state in terms of whether they're registered? Maybe they've taken the position, like I said, because it's an online promotion, they're not soliciting in, in that state and they're comfortable with that. And if they're comfortable with that, putting your contract that everybody's going to comply with the laws and indemnify each other if they don't, and you move forward. Uh, next, the charity is also going to have to... Uh, have their own obligations uh, when there is a commercial co-venture. They need to file the contract in the three states uh, mentioned. They need to separately register promotion in those three states. And the charity needs to file post-promotion reports 
in those three states identified. So the charity doesn't just necessarily sit back and collect the donations. They do have their own statutory requirements uh, when there is a commercial co-venture happening. Next on the charity's uh, radar, go ahead, Ann. Next on the charity's radar is what they could do to advertise or to acknowledge the promotion. Uh, for those of you who know uh, accounting uh, or know about the uh, uh, UBIT, the uh, issue comes up in a charity cannot act as a commercial entity. So therefore, when there is a commercial co-venture going on, the rule of thumb is the charity can acknowledge that this promotion is going on, but they can't advertise it. What does that mean? They could they could use they could let the brand use their name. They could mention that the brand is a sponsor. They could approve of this promotion, but they can't go into the issue of hey, uh, the brand's having this promotion. So here's a link to the brand sales page to make this happen. They can't say things like buy this band's product because the competing brands aren't as good and this brand supporting us. They can't go out and actually be an active advertiser. They can just acknowledge. Thanks, Ann. As I said, that's because they could get hit with unrelated business income tax. And if they are so bad at it, the states could even revoke their charitable status because they're now acting as a commercial entity, not as a charity. Go ahead, Ann. So the New York Attorney General a number of years back actually published some best practices uh, for running a commercial co-venture. And they're very thoughtful, they're very obvious, and it would be good uh, basically saying, hey, this is what we're concerned about. And New York is one of the states that have commercial co-venture laws uh, and describe the promotion make it easier for consumers to know what the amount is, be transparent about what you're doing, both uh, and importantly in social media. And the other thing they point out, which is not at all a statutory requirement, but tell the public how much you raised. Besides just at the beginning telling the public, hey, if you do this, we'll do that, we'll donate that. Let them know about the promotion. It's good for you because it shows that, uh, you're raising money for charity. And it also confirms with the public that this really happened, that you're not just telling us on day one, if you buy this pen, we'll make the donation. You're telling us on day 90 that we actually made the donation to give them the, the, the support there. Uh, Brian, I know this isn't as much of an area that you get involved with, but uh, in any of your experiences here, is there any other practices uh, that you might consider? Yeah, I, again, I would just go back to the point I made earlier of just having open lines of, of communication um, and not wanting to get caught flat footed on this. The more you have even just internal CLEs or whatever version you call them with your marketing colleagues, I think the better about these things. And then obviously, I think that the basic principles of, of advertising law, like you went through, Rob, apply, which is be transparent, be clear. Uh, you know, if something's important and relevant to how a consumer is going to make a decision, maybe don't bury it in small text at the bottom where no one's going to see it or look, maybe promote that he more heavily in the in the primary body of the ad. Uh, otherwise, I think just good common sense goes a, a long way, as, as you indicated here with the guidance from the New York AG. Right. And I think the common sense gets into what I have here for the others. Uh, gets back to what I talked about, what we talked about, about being genuine, uh, having the consideration from uh, the millennials to know that this is legit. Uh, have a charity that complements your business. The Dream Hotels, they did a promotion where they supported No More, which was a charity to stop domestic violence and sexual assault. Uh, do more than donate. Make it a whole uh, program where the sales is a part of what's going on. Uh, you have situations where uh, you want to get your employees involved. As I mentioned with the uh, Kimberly Clark, Henkel, they have the MIT make a, uh, an impact on tomorrow where they grant employees uh, paid leave to make a difference. And 
do things with regard to charity uh, that the employees are interested in. Uh, PepsiCo has the foundation where they provide millions of dollars uh, that ends up going to, to grants and uh, of either money or products. Uh, and it starts hitting at charities that are important to the company. Uh, dealing with positive nutrition or with the uh, water impact. And consider the long-term relationship. We have MasterCard, Stand Up to Charity, and a lot of the other ones I mentioned who do have long-term relationships. The more the public sees that you're doing these things, the more those numbers in terms of do they really believe this is a genuine thing start to go down. So just best practice tips, uh, not necessarily legal issues, but it all does get to the issue of making it uh, be a genuine thing that, that, that the consumers can rely upon. So I have some questions and then I'm gonna, is there a private right of action for violation of any of these rules or enforcement entirely at the discretion of state's attorneys generals? Generally, it's state's attorneys generals uh, who would have the right of action. You don't see uh, a, a large amount of private rights of actions. Frankly, I don't know if I've seen basically any private rights of actions out there in these situations. Uh, it's possible you could have a, a class action because the individual cause of action would be so small that uh, you know you were promised that a, a, a nickel from your purchase would go to charity. So generally it's being regulated from the states themselves uh, when it comes up and it's infrequent. I mean, we, we have, you know, as an example, years and years ago, in terms of the disclosure issue, YoPlay was uh, the, the Georgia attorney general uh, dinged YoPlay because YoPlay didn't disclose the, I think it was the maximum amount of the donation until under the lid. So you had to make the purchase first until you found out that there was gonna be a maximum donation. And Georgia said, that's not good. We don't like the way you did that. And imposed, a, I think like a $63,000 fine or something like on YoPlay for doing it for doing it that way. So it's pretty, really far, few and far in between. It's more the big, big, big issues that are a problem, but conceivably, any of these advertising or uh, other non-compliance with the statute could get you in, in trouble with the uh, states, less, less likely with the consumers. Next, from Maureen, if we say we are donating five cents per purchase up to a max of 25, what happens if we collect $10,000 in, in 5,000? Can we give the full 25 or are we limited to 20 to 10K? Maureen, very good question once again. Uh, something that comes up, I think it might even be in my frequently asked question, so I'll go by it really quickly uh, when that comes up. But the bottom line, minimums and maximums are something, as Brian mentioned, you need to talk about beforehand. So you need to have an idea of what you're going to expect from a sales promotion. How much are we going to really trigger in donations, taking into account that the promotion itself may uh, increase our sales. So if you're going to have a minimum donation, uh, conceivably, when you're advertising to the public, buy this and we'll donate that. If, you're minim if you believe that you're going to make $100,000 in donations as a result of sales from your promotion, and you believe that you believe that you then have a minimum of $90,000. Then conceivably, when you're saying to the public, if you purchase this, we'll donate that, that's not really happening because you've already committed a minimum of $90,000 in any event. So you're really not triggering any donations if you know that that's how much you're always going to make. So yeah, it's arguably misleading advertising if your minimum's too high, uh, if your maximum's too low, that you know 
you go that you know conceivably you made this a three month promotion and over three months you're going to make a million dollars in donations if you just let it run out but you say that the maximum donation is a hundred thousand dollars and you know you're going to hit that in the first two weeks so what happens now i have advertising out there in month two that says buy this and we'll donate that but you've already hit the maximum yes you have the disclosure that the maximum is X amount of dollars, but it needs to be considered that are you really misleading the public by continuing this promotion when you know you've already hit your maximum? Mins and maxes are something that really needs to be considered so you hit the sweet spot where your advertising is really something that's triggering a donation. And it's really uh, the min and max is, is more just guiding the expectations of the parties, but you're not being misleading to the public. So. It is a situation. Maureen, to answer your question in particular, if you'd make more of a donation than you promised, yay for you, not a problem. Always good. Okay. If you over, if you, well, basically in life, if you do more than is expected, no one's going to be upset with you. You're not violating any laws and everybody thinks it's great. So by all means, donate as much as you conceivably can. And so this is the proceeds will be done. Help me do If so, does company later selects the recipients? Okay, so you have a you have your own foundation, and your foundation says that uh, that your disclosures are, are. Sorry, if everybody can't read this, I'm I'm mumbling through. Earlier, I believe you suggested that coventures need to be tied to specific charities, but rather to the company's own foundation. If that is correct, may the solicitation say. The proceeds will be donated to general charitable purpose, such as helping children or fighting climate change. If so, does the company subject itself to risk when it later selects the recipients? Typically, you're going to say in your disclosures for a commercial co-venture that the charity is your foundation. You're going to identify it, that it's the, the charity that this money is going to is your foundation. You're going to make a link you're gonna highlight where people can get information about your foundation. Link online is, is usually sufficient. And you could then say that the money would be used towards helping children fighting climate change. And therefore the foundation pursuant to its own rules that it has on how it makes its donations to other charities, as long as they file uh, following their rules, you're all good. So in terms of disclosures for commercial co-ventures, you could say that it's going to be used to help children to fight climate change, et cetera. And that's a sufficient thing. If you think that, that it's not going to be used for those things, then you're probably going to you know, put in your advertising that it will help, uh, help fight climate change, et cetera. Or maybe use some kind of conditioning word that doesn't imply that all of the money will necessarily be used for children's charities or for climate change charities, but will generally be used for that purpose. So that's an advertising disclosure issue, just to make sure you're being uh, on the up and up with that. Uh, I have to say the first magic word for those of you writing it down because we're well over time here. So I'm gonna go a lot quicker through some of these things. Uh, sorry, as I mentioned, Anne, I thought I could get two hours out of commercial co-ventures, and I guess I could. But uh, the first magic word is spring. So write it down. Okay, I'm going to cover this area because I'm getting questions. It seems like it's it's a popular area, uh, but I will uh, try not to repeat myself and go a little quicker here. So. Uh, all profits to charity, portion of proceeds to charities. These don't comply with the commercial co-venture laws. You see it all the time. I can't tell you. They don't comply. But if the company always does this, you can make the argument that it's now not a sales promotion. It's a business way of doing things, and it's not a sales promotion. So if the company's always giving all profits to charity, uh, it might not be a commercial co-venture, and you could hang your hat on that. As a, as a reason for doing it that way. As I said, minimum and maximum donations have issues. Next. Uh, I've already cut, see, this is great. We had the questions, we cover a lot of this stuff. 
the donations to your own foundation. Uh, these are some of the considerations as we spoke about. Next, Dan. As I mentioned, we've already covered the sweepstakes for these frequently asked questions. Obviously, are frequently asked questions. I am very impressed. Next. Uh, covered the no purchase activities. Next. And in commercial co venture world, uh, within these statutes, uh, there's also definitions of others. The ones you need to be con uh, concerned about are professional fundraisers or paid solicitors or uh, like terms. That's where the brand is actually getting money. They're getting paid, usually by the charity, for making the solicitation. So, for instance, if you're running a sweepstakes and you're saying you as a brand is running a sweepstakes, you're saying uh, if you pay a dollar, uh, a portion will be donated to charity, uh, but we're going to keep 30 cents of that. You may very well be a professional fundraiser because you're soliciting funds and taking a cut. Uh, fundraising council are just the people getting paid to counsel the charities on this. And I've already mentioned the charitable trustee. The deal with professional fundraising and fundraising council, if you fall into those categories, generally when you're making money, directly from the donation. When you're making money from what's supposed to be the donation, which is perfectly fine, but if you're doing that, you then have, you're gonna fall into these categories and these categories are re heavily regulated. Most states require the uh, fundraiser to post a bond, to make all kinds of registrations, to po file post-promotion uh, reports, so if you're going to be a professional fundraiser, I recommend doing it as a business, not as a side for one particular promotion. Uh, I have to repeat the magic word again. And the word for your CLE is spring. Uh, so next. Next. Dan. Finally, we will get into the new law. Uh, the California AB 488, which is called the Supervision of Trustees and Fundraisers for Charitable Purposes Act. As I mentioned, it was passed last year. It's effective on January 1, 2023. As of today, there's proposed reg regulations that came out a number of month ago, months ago. The new regulations have not been approved by California. They're not in effect, but the statute has been amended, and the regulations basically just follow the statute. So uh, for all intents and purposes, uh, you're still going to have to comply with the new law starting January 1. The big requirement is registration. So next. next. The deal is, if it's an online charitable promotion that's involving a charity in some way, uh, and it's in California, you have to seriously consider whether you're going to have to register under the new law. And this would include any types of donations by the consumer, roundups, peer-to-peer -peer sweepstakes, or donations by the brand, where, as a question was asked before, what if we have uh, the donors, uh, what if we have the people choose where we should donate, uh, and it could include commercial co-ventures. So if you're having anything online that involves a charity, you need to consider it a new law. I'm going to go over some of the general requirements for you now, but you need to dig a little bit deeper. And as Brian recommended before, this is an area where you need to pre-plan because you can't start your promotion January 1 uh, if, you haven't, if you're not complying and registering by January 1. So next, the key is this for a brand. You're going to have these six different areas that could trigger your registration requirements. So I'll go over them briefly here. Where you identify specific charities. So getting back to that issue, is this a charitable cause or is this, a, is this an identifying a charity? For California's new law, if you identify a charity or a number of charities that are gonna receive donations that are made by the customers who are going online regarding your promotion, you're going to have to register. So that's a online asking the customer 
making the customer making a donation, identifying a charity. Two, that's where you, the brand, are saying that you're making a donation to charity based upon this promotion. That will be another area. Three, where you're listing specific charities, commercial co-venture, from purchases or other activity from the consumer. So that could be a situation that could, tri to, to tribute, could trigger registration. Four, peer-to-peer, -peer, you're allowing online GoFundMe type situations. That could, could trigger regulation. Five, if you act as a professional fundraiser or counsel, which you should do very specifically if you want to. I don't recommend doing it unless that's what you really want to do. And next, if you actually set up the internet for the charity, uh, an internet based for the charity itself, uh, an internet based platform for the charity, you're going to have to register. So you got to dig into the regulations on when they apply, but those are the six situations online in California where you need to consider, am I going to have to comply with this? When you comply, you're going to have to register. You pay a fee, but you don't have to pay a bond. You're going to have to file an annual report. So if I file January 1, 2023, by next January, January, or sorry, July 2024, I got to file a report with California that says all of the activities that I did that previous year. And I'm going to have to renew my registration every year on January 15th. Next, besides registration, if you're going to be within the law in California, you have to first confirm that your charity is in good standing in California. So going back to that issue, are they registered? California is saying, yes, we want to make sure that your charity is registered here and it's on the good charity list. So you have to search to make sure that they're on the list before you could deal with them. And if they're not on the list, they have five days to get on the list. If they're not on the list and they, and they don't get on the list in time, you can't make your donations to them or at least tell the, the consumers that that's what you're doing. Next, uh, you're going to have need the charity's consent, except in some situations, but generally you need the charity's consent. So you're gonna need a written agreement and it's gonna to have to have the provisions that you would expect. When you're gonna make a donation, what you're gonna do with the money, if you're gonna keeping any of the money uh, and, you could, and if you are gonna have any provision about the charity approving the message that's going out there, uh, that needs to be in your contract. The last one, identify all brands, means that if you and a number of other brands and other different companies are all getting together with one charity to help uh, in a particular thing, all of the brands need to identi be identified in your contract. And the uh, law specifically says that this agreement is subject to, to at least being available to the attorney general. So getting back again to what we were talking about before, by you know, it's possible now that the attorney general has this in front of them to make sure that you're complying with the law. As I said, we don't have a track record on how strict California is going to be with any of these requirements. I can only tell you what the law says as of right now, but not any good practical guidance on how it's going to be administered. Uh, there are examples where you don't need the charity consent, and that's as long as you just give the charity's name, rank, and serial number, something essentially that you're not going to be violating their intellectual property rights by just saying their name out there. Uh, that's okay. But, uh, and also saying that the charity has not approved this. And if the charity does get wind that you're now one to make donations to them, they could tell you, no, we don't want your donation. Uh, as I mentioned also, California also still has on the books the commercial co-venture law. Commercial co-venture law says you have to register unless you meet the contract requirements and assigned by two officers. So if you're going to have an agreement with the charity and it's commercial co-venture related, make sure you're considering that previous law also. Thanks, Ann. There's not, there, there are disclosure requirements in the law, but because it covers so many different types of areas, it's not like it's really covering 
uh, what you need to say in a particular promotion, but they do mention in the law that basically the charity could use the, the money for any purpose. So even if you're telling the consumers in, in the big language that uh, you're going to help X, Y, Z by making this donation, you need to disclose that, uh, you know what, the charity could do this for whatever valid purpose that they're allowed to do it for. We can't restrict the donations. Uh, you need to provide the tax receipt from the charity needs to provide the tax receipt in five business days. And uh, you need to notify another more onerous requirement on the brand that if you are within the statute, that you need to tell the consumers that your donation the donation they gave to you and when you handed the money over to the charity or when they did something to trigger you to don't to make the donation to the charity when that was made you need to tell the consumers hey we made that donation unless the donors <laughs> request not to be notified what does that mean best best practice have them during this online promotion, have them affirmatively check that they don't require notice that you gave the donation to charity, uh, not necessarily buried in the any particular terms of the promotion itself, that they aren't able to specifically uh, waive out of getting this notice. But like I said, it's another area that you need to consider because something more and additional that California is requiring. Next. There are time frames in there. They get a little inane, to tell you the truth, uh, in detail why. So uh, you do have requirements for when to send a donation next. Next time. Uh, with the donation, you need to tell the charity, uh, you know, give them an accounting and basically tell them why you made what the donation is based upon next. And like I said, the main things. Uh, for here to consider. It's online only. It's California only. Obviously, if you're concerned, you're not up to speed on this yet. It's an online promotion. You can avoid California uh, until you're up to speed on this. Uh, it does require the pre-planning. It does uh, include more than just commercial co-ventures. There are penalties and specifically the enforcement comes by way of the attorney general who could do all kinds of nasty things to you. One little thing I wanna point out because we focus so much on commercial co-ventures, the other fun quirk of the new California law is for commercial co-ventures specifically. So all you do online is commercial co-ventures. It doesn't kick in until you have more than six different charities involved. Why? Because, you know, they, California didn't want to put more onerous burdens on commercial co-ventures. So it's only those situations where you're going to be having basically more than six commercial co-venture programs throughout the year. So most companies aren't going to hit that requirement. So if you're only doing commercial co-ventures, you're keeping it to under six, to six or under, don't, don't worry about the, the new law is the bottom line. So thanks for the next topic is influencer marketing. We finally get to it. Half an hour, we could get there. We'll stay late if we have to. Now, uh, are we getting a code for the first half of the CLE? Lori, yes, I'll give you the code again. It's spring. I'm only allowed to say it twice, so I didn't say that. Okay, influencer marketing. Basically, your employee, your employee, leading niche content creators to improve your brand awareness, to increase traffic, to drive messages, to target your audience. So, Brian, do you use influencers? Oh, yes. It is, it, is a, it is a growing and increasingly core part of our market strategy, reaching, <clears throat> Rob, as you said earlier in this conversation, uh, Gen Z, millennials across all social media platforms, uh, I'm not aware of any CPG out there that doesn't play in the space in some form. And so uh, it is it is a it is something that maybe five, six, seven years ago, none of us would have thought we'd spend so much time on. But now it's it's a key item that we all have to be uh, aware of. Yes, yes. And, uh, you know, people out there, I know, uh, you know, Pepsi recently had the emoji 
on the, the product line at Walgreens where they had limited edition packaging with emojis on it. And they wanted to have the hashtag say it with Pepsi to incorporate the, that new emoji bottle. Uh, a dramatic increase in impressions, dramatic increase in engagements. Uh, the I know Guinness has, uh, with their Black Shines uh, Brightest, has been using influencers in Africa, specifically uh, comedians, uh, choreographers, uh, singers, to uh, help uh, give more notice to the Guinness brand in Africa. And I think that has been uh, a really good thing. And another shout out to Guinness. Guinness, my favorite beer. Uh, the, 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 the Stouty, if those of you who aren't familiar with the Stouty, where you can get your picture on the top of the head of the Guinness. And this has been something that has been trumpeted with uh, hashtags and by using influencers uh, and has really increased the awareness and especially getting the younger generation to understand that uh, you know Guinness is not uh, some beer to be afraid of. So, uh, and we're gonna, time-wise, we're gonna skip this comedian making fun of influencers uh, and go right on to the next one. No, we can skip that in, thank you. So the numbers here, if you get your materials, you can get more detail here. Bottom line is that, uh, Influencer marketing is very is effective, and it's sometimes as as noticed on the last uh, bullet point there, it's somewhat of an inexpensive way to get the word out there, uh, in some ways, and very popular with the youngins. Uh, Brian, are these numbers sort of consistent with you know what you uh, what you see out there and the reasons why you're doing it? Yes, absolutely. I come. For all the reasons discussed, yes. If you want to yeah, play in the space, you gotta you gotta be on the influencer, be with the influencer. Yeah, yeah, that that's what the kids like. Uh, yeah. Next are the pitfalls of doing uh, influencer marketing, and as we'll see, this is the area where you see a lot of enforcement. Uh, when you're doing this, you are reaching out and asking people sometimes very prominent uh, people who might get into trouble on their own, sometimes very fringe element people who you might not know a lot about, but they have a lot of followers. So because you're getting into an area, you have the potential of uh, having some issues with this. So I think the pre-planning, once again, is a big issue with this. And what people see is, are these numbers legitimate? Uh, when you're trying to engage influencers, are they are they themselves really able to give you as much bang for the buck as they promised? So, yeah, I would just, Rob, I would, I would yeah. add on top of that, there are a lot of wannabes out there who, and this I think this goes into the the inflated numbers that you pointed out here. And so, yeah, to your point, it's it's really critical to do some due diligence on that. And I would similar with the CCV discussion we had earlier, think about you know, what is your request list for your marketing team that they have to ask and check the boxes for before they engage any influencer, just to make sure this person is who they say they are and that we're not buying a, a you know, a bill of goods, so to speak. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a big, that 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 is the big, big thing you got to be concerned about because not only, uh, you know, could you get pie in the face in terms of uh, getting some bad press about an influencer, but, you know, the FTC could come after you because this, uh, whoever is getting you these influencers or the influencers themselves, uh, you know, maybe making up the numbers. So tough to look into, but definitely something you need to do. So next, influencers come up in terms of regulation in three different areas. First, you have the General FTC Act, which... Uh, very broadly prohibits unfair deceptive acts or practices. So that's the law, and that's what will be enforced. Then you have the FTC guidelines, which isn't law, but what the FTC relies upon heavily to determine whether you've broken the law in terms of unfair deceptive acts or practices. And these are the guidelines for the use of endorsements and testimonials. So I'll point out that these aren't specific to influencers, and they cover more than just 
influencers. They cover any time there's an endorsement or testimonial, but influencers are encompassed within that because what the influencer is doing is essentially giving generally an endorsement or testimonial. So that's why it's not the influencer guides, it's the endorsement testimonial guides, which are broader than influences, but influences are within that. I mentioned here that influencers could be regulated specifically with regard to drugs and medical devices. I'm not gonna get into that here, but if you are involved in that area, make sure you check out the CFR in that regard. Next. So because influencers are uh, regulated by the uh, endorsement guidelines, we need to know what an endorsement is. So it's an advertising message that reflects opinions, beliefs, findings, experiences of a party other than an advertiser. Essentially, if your message is saying, a third, if, you're, if a third party is saying in your message, I like that, you probably have an endorsement in some way. So next, let's break that down. Any advertising message. So it could be verbal. It could be written. It could be a demonstration where uh, Tiger Woods is just hitting a golf ball. And it's very obvious that the golf ball has the name of a brand on there. And he's hitting it, and that ball is going a miles and miles and miles. That could possibly be an advertising message, even though not a word is spoken, uh, because you have the depiction of the name, logo, et cetera, with the brand. So advertising message, very broadly uh, defined. Uh, next. As I said, uh, it includes any type of... Uh, basically endorsement or favorable opinion of the brand. And the new uh, regulations that are coming out, the new recommended regulations from the FTC specifically say the tags, pins, and likes are included. Uh, if it's a posting an image that's in a favorable way, if it's giving a shout out, uh, they're all endorsements. Next, like I said, if it's something that you're putting out there, or encouraging you to put out there that says, hey, I like this brand. You gotta really consider whether you're gonna be within the endorsement guidelines. So if you are within the endorsement guidelines, the endorser, your influencer in this instance, has certain requirements. They gotta, now go back in, they gotta tell the truth. Uh, and it needs to be based upon something that actually happened. Uh, and they need to be a bona fide user of your product or service at the time when they're saying, uh, when they're giving their endorsement. Very easily to understand why, but you could also understand situations where this is not the case. So you got to make sure your influencer, this is their honest opinion. You're not just buying their opinion and they need to have actually used the product or service and have that genuine opinion about it. Next. You as the brand have your own obligations also. Besides just double checking on your influencer, you can't distort the opinion. You can't make it sound better than it was. If you believe your influencer now no longer has that opinion about your product, you can't keep using the advertising. If they actually are making a claim that needs to, a claim about the product, this is the, we all, we all know in advertising uh, that there is the issue of, is this a claim? Is it puffery? Is it a claim? Is it whatever? So if it's going to come within the definition of this is a claim, that we are the number one selling product in North America, that's something that can be backed up. It can be substantiated. So if that's something that's being repeated by your influencer online, that needs to be substantiated. They're basically stepping into your shoes and making this claim. So you can't just have them out there saying random crazy things uh, that can't be backed up when, when it's a claim. Uh, next, if what you're saying involves more than one, if there's a claim that involves more than one influencer, they all need to agree on it. Now, next, what do you disclose? So now we know we have a duty to disclose. So what do we disclose? 
we got to disclose the material connection that can materially affect the weight or credibility of the endorsement. So what's a, a material connection? Use your common sense. Basically, that there is some connection between you and the influencer. This isn't just some random Joe Schmo that's giving an opinion about this. They are getting something in return from you. And it could be money. It could be a coupon. It could be just a chance to go on a commercial. So you're running a sweepstakes. The winner's going to be a chance to be on an ad. And in this sweepstakes, you want everybody to say how great your product is. This is now an endorsement just because they all have the chance to appear. Maybe the individual person never even got anything in return. They just went through the trouble of making this uh, two minute post uh, on your website, but you were giving them the chance. This is now an endorsement. So you need to comply with the guidelines. Basically, you can't assume that everybody knows that this is an endorser, that this is an influencer that you hired. Basically, unless they're a complete stranger, it's very common that you're going to have a material connection. You need to get to make a disclosure. Thanks, Sam. Next. As I said, some, some examples are obvious, some examples are not as obvious. So let's say you have a drug company, that's the brand. They're paying for the research, that's it. But the research company is completely independent. They're finding their own, they're finding their own uh, opinion about this. They're doing the research, they get their own honest uh, opinion, they get their own honest results. And now they publish those results. They, they say what those results are. You now want to publish those results. There's a material connection because you started off by paying for this, this in and of itself, even though you didn't try to influence in any way what their opinions were. Uh, if you have a known athlete and a sponsor that's talking about your product on a talk show, that could be a material connection. Uh, if the consumer's told that they're going to be in an ad. So you have the, uh, you go to a, you go to your, you have a camera in your store. You say, hey, tell me about your product. And you have the camera standing there pointing at the consumer saying, tell us all about our product. That's now an endorsement because they're in material, a material connection. They get the impression that they're going to be on television. Hidden camera, not the same. They don't know they're going to be, they're not getting anything out of giving this opinion. Uh, and obviously, if you're receiving uh, free products, and basically anytime any of your employees are making any postings about your product, they're all going to have a material connection because they're your employees. Next. As I said, there's almost always a material connection involved. It's conceivable that if everybody knows that this is your influencer, or everybody knows this is a spokesperson for your brand, that you might not need to make the uh, disclosure itself of the material connection. But better safe than sorry, best to tell everybody that this person is uh, making an endorsement and to comply with the guidelines, which I will tell you now how to comply with them. Rob, can I just, yes, I would hop yes, in here and just say it quickly, this is similar to the CCV item we discussed earlier. It's, it's goes a long way to have a little pre-planning with all this stuff. I mean, I've, I've been in situations where we've had to tell influencers, we, you know, notwithstanding all the great benefits you've extolled for our products, you, you didn't say the right things or you showed something in your ad you weren't supposed to, or you didn't make the right disclosures. And so we've got to go back and reshoot content, or maybe we don't even think about using it depending on the circumstances. Uh, which is always a tough conversation to have and not a great place to be given the time and, and consideration going into uh, you know, getting the right content up on social media. So the more you can vet this ahead of time with your uh, marketing colleagues, the more you can work with folks who have experience in this space, I think the better and you get a better product at the end of the day too. Yeah, and, and like you said, the timing here is usually something that's more on a critical basis, uh, you know, because it's online, because it's social media related. A lot of this is, you know, needs to get out there very quickly. So we have a question about what to put in the contract. Once again, frequently asked question. I'm going to get to that in a second. Uh, next, Dan. So 
how do you make this disclosure? You know you have a material connection. You know there's an endorsement. What do you need to do? Well, you need to make a disclosure so it's hard to miss. Place, it, it's all context. I can't just tell you that you say, no person necessary must be 18 or older, blah, 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 blah. There's not specific things that you have to say, but you have to make it clear that this is an endorsement. So how do you do that? You got to make it hard to miss. Place it with the endorsement itself. Do not put it in the general terms and conditions that our website may, may include endorsements. Blah, blah, blah. No, if there's an endorsement happening, tell them with that endorsement, this is how it's happening. If uh, it's, it's a post, it, it should be right there in the first line of the text. If it's a, a video uh, or if it's a picture, it needs to be disclosed in the video or on the picture. If it's a live stream, you should say it often because it's not just going to be there in front of somebody's face to look at. Uh, if there are built-in tools, so you're using a, a program, you're using a platform that uh, you're told, oh, we have, you know, yeah, don't worry, you know, we have, we do all the right things to make sure that these disclosures are made. Don't trust them. Make sure that that gets out there, that you are making it very hard to miss, that this is an endorsement, because this is an area now, because it's so popular, that the FTC is going to be looking at. Next. Next, Dan, wake up. Thank you. Uh, so the hard to miss and some of the recommendations from the FTC, uh, they shouldn't have to scroll down. You shouldn't have to click more. You shouldn't have 20 hashtags with one of them being ad or promotion. Uh, it should be, uh, you know, self self contained. Uh, keep it on the screen for a reasonable time. Make sure it's not white on white or black on black. And it can't just be on the influencer's profile page that happens to mention that the influencer is an influencer for your company. Once again, make it, make it clear. The FTC is going to be looking at these things. Next. And. Can you go back one? Let's find out how to disclose. So how to disclose. You could say things like, thank you, Acme brand, for the free product. You could say words, Acme partner, Acme ambassador. You could say advertisement, ad, or sponsored. These are now known ways that make it clear that this is an endorsement complying with the uh, endorsement guidelines. Hashtag ad, hashtag sponsored. These are good. Next are the bad ones. Can't just say hashtag sp or hashtag spawn or hashtag thanks or hashtag brand or hashtag ambassador without the name, uh, without the brand name and ambassador. Uh, it gets a little tricky, but when you look at these two together, a little more disclosure goes a long way. Hashtag brand ambassador, brand name ambassador. Uh, is much better than just saying the brand or the ambassador uh, from the influencer. Next. So penalties, FTC Act, you could get a big fine, injunctions. You could, you could be hold civilly liable. So going back to the original question, who do I have to worry about? You have to worry about both the regulators and the people. Next. So along with the FTC, uh, as I said, this has now become uh, something that the FTC is really being concerned about. As I'll mention a little later on, uh, they've uh, made recommendations to their uh, guidelines uh, to make some changes or updates to the guidelines that just came out this year. Last year, the FTC sent this, quote, notice of penalty offenses, uh, et cetera, to over 700 companies, agencies or retailers, and they warn them of unfair trade practices that can include this list of different things, all of them uh, involving the improper use of either endorsements or influencers or uh, some kind of testimonials about the company. Why did they do this? 
Because once you're on notice that there could be a problem, that triggers the civil penalties of $46,000. So the FTC knows what they're doing. Uh, when you have noticed that you may be doing something that's a problem, they could then tag you $46,000 per violation. So therefore, uh, the FTC went out and sent these notices. Not that there was necessarily a problem, but just to let you on notice. So uh, that was a big deal. FTC on the, on the, this issue is on their radar. Next. So the other way we see that this is on their radar is the FTC has this year uh, ramped up their enforcement actions. And I'll just go over a, a couple uh, enforcement actions uh, that made the news this year. Uh, this first one involved uh, the company Roomster. Uh, Roomster is involved in uh, an online company where you could uh, basically pay a service, pay I think like $30 a month, uh, where you could find roommates or apartments, uh, typically in hard to get areas, uh, cities uh, or uh, trying to find inexpensive uh, living in cities. Uh, and that's what you go. And the FTC said, hey, Roomster, uh, you had a lot of uh, fake rev reviews out there and you're posting these things. Next, Dan. So what they did was uh, a lawsuit was brought in New York federal court uh, just this August FTC in six states, just so you know, they're the states that you would probably guess. Uh, and these are the ones that are keeping these on their ra radar. California, Colorado, Florida, Illinois, Massachusetts, New York. They were the ones who brought this lawsuit along with the FTC. Uh, might give you a little indication on what states are looking at this. Uh, so it did involve uh, possible uh, fake positive reviews. And uh, the company, uh, basically, they were uh, the allegation is that Roomster hired a third party called AppWin uh, to get reviews, and AppWin sold them uh, fake rev reviews. And the person at the AppWin already settled with the FTC, paid a fine of a hundred thousand dollars, and is now helping. Uh, in the uh, case against Roomster. So that's a pending case, but once again, showing you that endorsements uh, uh, are on the FTC's radar. Next. Amazon, July of this year, they uh, brought a lawsuit against 10,000, 10,000 Facebook group administrators, uh, also concerned about fake reviews. Uh, they uh, are targeting the administrators who guarantee five-star reviews uh, and paying for reviews. So once again, this all ties into the influencer, the giving a review, the getting a material connection between them uh, on not just the FTCs, but private company like Amazon uh, bringing lawsuits, big lawsuit in uh, Washington state court. Next. The FTC came after uh, Fashion Nova, a retailer, uh, once again, for their product reviews. Uh, in that situation, they were only, po the, allegedly they were only posting the good reviews, the four to five star reviews, but they were suppressing the uh, negative reviews. Next, Dan. And this came in uh, January of this year. Uh, and actually, uh, it involved a uh, interface where automatically the four and five star reviews got posted, but Fashion Nova had the opportunity to post or not post any reviews that came up from zero to three stars. And allegedly, Fashion Nova didn't post the zero to three ones where they got the option to pick those or not. So FTC saw that this was happening, uh, brought an enforcement action, fined them $4.2 million. And in the consent order, uh, Fashion Nova agreed to post all product reviews. Next. Besides possible false reviews, uh, we have the issue of inadequate disclosures. 
getting to the issue of we now have an endorser, we now have an influencer, but the FTC is concerned that you're not telling the public that there is a material connection in the proper ways as we just discussed. So one recent example was against the company Kimi. Next, these are just some examples of what the posts were like from different influencers. And the FTC uh, brought an action uh, two years ago in Florida, says they didn't disclose the material connection. Uh, Timmy said, yes, we did, but they had to click on more uh, or the disclosure was in the uh, information page about the influencers. It wasn't on the, on the advertisements or on the endorsements themselves. Uh, that it wasn't, as I said in the text, it wasn't obvious. It wasn't in the first couple of lines. So because of that, they got hit with a big $15 million judgment, which did include some health claim violations. So it might not be all uh, that. But uh, what was notable this year is the FTC went back and it was highly publicized that they were able to give $930,000 back to the consumers from these penalties that they got from, from Timi just because they didn't have the adequate disclosures from the influencers on the uh, on the website. So, you know, Brian, let me, let me turn to you now before we run out of time. I know it's coming up, but, uh, you know, what kind of things do you do or do you recommend? Uh, because these influencer postings are generally generated by the influencer. So, uh, you know, as a company, you're holding your breath or crossing your fingers, hoping things go right. So what, what are the kinds of things you should be doing to make sure they do go right? Yeah, well, I think to go to an earlier point, having that checklist of items that you want to see from any influencer, having them, there's a question earlier about a contract, having maybe those things addressed in the contract in terms of what the influencers are expected to do, what marketing is supposed to vet for depending on the size and scope of your influencer campaigns, maybe you can get legal involved in pre-clearing some of these posts if there's some questionable content or you're not quite sure that something's uh, above board. Um, I think more communication, more disclosure is typically better about this. And then also having sometimes tough conversations saying, you know what, we just can't run this or this has to get taken down immediately because it doesn't meet certain requirements or the person isn't living up to them, their, the influencer isn't living up to their side of the bargain. Yeah, I, 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 th I think that's what you said. I think the communication is is the big issue because sometimes the influencers, they might not know that they have to do anything in particular. They just need to go out there and wear a pretty dress. And uh, <laughs> yeah, there's, this, that's, this, that's is, it. this is an area where a lot of people think they can do it with just like the flip of a switch. Like I'm just going to start posting content and hopefully someone will notice me or I'll get a, a quick and easy deal. Uh, it's obviously, as, as you've gone through here, Rob, a lot more complicated, a lot more involved with that. And the exposure can be pretty significant depending on you know, how bad you are. Right, and that, that's another good point you bring up. If you do just have the rogue uh, person who happens to wear your dress posted online and wants to get noticed, you're not going to have the material connection. So they're not, you're not within the endorsement guidelines, because now this is just a random third party saying, hey, I like your product. And there's not a material connection between you and them. If you then find that this person is highly influential, has a lot of followers, and you want them to now do this more often, that's the situation where they're now going to possibly have a material connection with your company. You're going to want to vet them. You're going to want to have contract with them. You're going to want to educate them on what they need to do now that they're a full-fledged endorser of your product. Uh, an older one, but one of the first ones that came up here was the uh, asymmetrical paisley dress for a mere $25 at Lord & Taylor. Uh, Lord & Taylor had a big promotion to promote this uh, dress, all kinds of regular people were, were told, hey, put a picture of yourself with this dress online. And they did. And the dress sold out in two days. Problem. Uh, the people didn't tell when they posted that they got the dress for free. So material connection, got a dress, posted it online. All they did was just post a picture of themselves online. That's now an endorsement, needs to comply. FTC said, this is what we're talking about. This is an endorsement. You need to comply with this. Uh, 
the uh, FTC, one of the things in, when they when they had a, a uh, consent order with uh, Lord and Taylor, they said that you need to make sure that you can uh, clearly and conspicuously disclose the connection. They need to make sure that they do this for the next 20 years. This was specifically in the consent order. So one, right at the very get-go, FTC is concerned about disclosure. Next. Not only do we have to worry about the FTC, but this is an SEC situation, Securities and Exchange Commission. You might have seen in the news where Kim Kardashian uh, didn't adequately dis disclose her connection with the cryptocurrency that she was promoting and that she got, what she got, about $250,000? She got $250,000 for promoting this. Now, this. For those of you who are uh, keeping score out there, this is not a FTC enforcement. This is not uh, endorsement guidelines, but I thought it relevant because it is getting news. It's getting news in terms of an influencer who is out there. And because this actually had happened to trigger the securities laws because uh, it involved the security, uh, this influencer for not adequately disclosing by only putting hashtag ad at the bottom of the post, uh, the SEC said that wasn't enough under our rules to show that there's a material connection between you and the securities that you're promoting. Next. Rob, I just want to yes. sorry to interrupt. We are at time. So in case you want to give out the the code, do the honors. I will give out the last code. The last code is fall. Fall is the last code. We're out of time. The only thing I want to mention on one of the later slides, and I won't let you go through with this, but if you're dealing with influencers, contract with influencers, keep going in. One more thing, which is important. Okay, as we talked about, for, for, for you out there, you, got, you, should, you need to have a contract with your influencer. You need to have that the influencer is complying with the laws and in particular the FTC guidelines. Tell them what they need to disclose. Give them examples so they know this is what I need to do on any time I post any kind of endorsement about your product. You should have a morals clause in there so you can get out of there when this influencer does something as you may as, as, as bad. Uh, you want to make sure they're not your employee, that they're an independent contractor, and you want to have a provision in there that they're going to cooperate with the brand in case there's any investigation. Uh, very important. So I want to point those things out uh, in terms of the influencers. Make sure you train them. Make sure you educate them. Make sure you educate your employees. Thank you for saying so much longer. Sorry if I rushed the last part. Uh, but they are some important items. I'm willing to take any questions or you could call me afterwards if you have any questions that we missed here, but I want to get let you get back to your life. Brian, thank you so much. Do you have any thank closing you. thoughts that you want to impart? No, uh, uh, great presentation. Thank you, Rob. A lot of good ground covered. So happy to answer any All questions right. as well that may come up. Thank you. So there is a lot to cover. Feel free to get in touch with me, talk with Brian if you have any specific questions. Sorry we ran out of time. Take care. Take care, all. Bye-bye.